Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And in, in the middle of Tommy's week, we have an RAF show for you. Roland White, who has written about the post-war era with other aviation books, has tackled the iconic Mosquito for his latest work. Links to purchasing the book are in the description below, as there are to Roland's website. I've got a copy of the book here. It's getting rave reviews. Um, I think we th thought it was fantastic. We'll talk about what I liked about it and what Roland was trying to achieve when we get into just talking to him in a minute. Just to say, if you are new to the channel, don't forget all the information you need is in the description below. You'll find links to them, my guest websites and their books and resources. But without further ado, I'll bring Roland in. Good evening, sir. How are you today? Uh, very good, Paul. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Thank you for being here. So as I said there in the, in the, uh, in the introduction, you, you've tackled the post-war period and Harriers and other things like that. This is your first venture into World War II, which is a massive great area <laughs> with some incredible writers and historians with huge legacy. Was it a bit um, um, uh, uh, nervous of you to step yeah. from your comfort zone into World War II? Completely. I mean, you put sort of hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's, that's pretty much the reason I didn't do it, um, because it sort of felt like it was a, it was a really well populated area. Um, you know, I was working on something else when the pandemic hit and realised that I wasn't going to be able to sort of cover the ground to, uh, to sort of meet all the uh, various people uh, who I was, I'd been planning to, to sort of finish that, that book. Uh, so the question then was, what do I do? How do I make use of my time? Um, uh, and, and there was actually a little more time, wasn't commuting in and out of London, uh, productively. Um, and World War II felt like uh, it offered the best opportunity. I'd always had half an eye on this Mosquito story. Um, uh, it, it was a real life sort of 633 squadron story. And and it seemed to me, well, certainly it hadn't been done latterly. And a lot of people had written about the Spitfire, or the Lancaster, sometimes the Hurricane as well. But for some extraordinary reason, um, there hadn't been uh, you know, anyone who, who tackled the Mosquito. And yet it rapidly became evident to me as I, I kind of got started on it that, um, you know, Mosquito was lots of people's favourite aeroplane. So uh, I, I sort of felt fortunate to have uh, found my interests and the interests perhaps of, uh, of, of the readership um, were aligned. Um, but it meant, you know, I could work on archive sources and um, and uh, secondary sources as well, and, and a handful of primary interviews as well uh, to produce something which, you know, I hope reads a little bit like those, those Cold War books, um, but uh, was tackled in a slightly different way just uh, through necessity, you know, that there aren't many veterans left now. Well, as Matthew Greenfield has just said, just finished the book, couldn't put it down. It's a cracking read. And I, and, and that's one of the things we were just talking Thanks, before Matthew. we went live is it's it's not really in some senses of the word an aviation book. And what I mean yeah. is you could fill pages and pages with just a breakdown of the various types of mosquito and the development of them and the changes in where they put the machine guns and the canopies and the bomb bay doors and this and that and the and the engines and um and why didn't you do that? Well, I mean, it's been done, first of all. I mean, there are, you know, there are excellent books out there that are kind of encyclopedic on, you know, how many marks of Mosquito there were and how many of each of those marks um, served with the Air Force and, and, and other air arms. But that's never really been what's drawn me to, to the writing at all. I think, you know, I've always had an interest in airplanes, but in terms of actually writing books, it struck me that war... Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, through my own interest in aviation, the, the, the way that airplanes are used in war and the people who, who fly them um, are uh, sort of operating at the very sort of limits of uh, human capability and hu human endeavour. So you've, you've always got these, you know, extreme human stories. And it's fascinating, I think, to kind of really dig into uh, how people at the top of their game perform um, in circumstances which, you know, feel, well, I mean, to me, far beyond anything I'd be capable of. I mean, these are, as I say, these are remarkable stories uh, uh, of, um, of of extreme human um, achievement capability. And uh, and I think it's 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 that that really appeals to me. It's always the people at the heart of the story that, that for me, drive it on. Brilliant. And we will obviously get to the, 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 crux of today's show which is about Denmark and I'll ask you why mm -hmm. why why Denmark but given that I live in Normandy and, and given that that the mosquito has a big connection with with France and the raid on Amiens prison and and um pre pre D day to me that seems to be the aspect <clears throat> that when the mosquito has been talked about has been talked about the most that kind of 
bringing yeah. about the invasion, supporting that, and and yet you chose, to, as I said there, to go with Denmark and 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 the yeah. bringing in of the Danish resistance, the Danish people. To me, was the genius with the book is that it's it's like you've got two two stories going at the same time. There's the air story and there's the ground story. The air coming from the UK mm -hmm. and the ground story over in Europe. And you know when when you've got a, a a legacy such as the mosquito had, and we haven't even touched on what it was doing out in the Far East and Burma, is, you know, why did you decide that Denmark was the, going to be the, the main focus of your writing? Well, I think it comes back again to uh, to the question about um, writing a story rather than writing a, um, a sort of technical manual. Um, and, uh, you know, as you say, the, the, the mosquito operations either side of D-Day are remarkable. Um, but at the same time, they were doing the same thing night after night after yeah. night of going after uh, um, the transport networks and uh, reinforcements and resupplies uh, at night while uh, um, Ninth Air Force and Tutaf did, did the same thing by, by, by two group rather did the same thing by day. Um, and um, in Denmark, what you had through the raids against the Gestapo headquarters were uh, operations that... Um, had a very similar feel. In fact, that they, they inspired it. Um, the the had a very similar feel to uh, the um, six three three squadron movie. I mean, mm. that are a real life six three three squadron. Much to some people's surprise, is fiction, uh, but undoubtedly those raids on uh, on Denmark and on uh, Quisling's headquarters in Norway um, on on the Amiens prison. They were that they were the missions that inspired six three three squadron. And I think um, perhaps to those who are less familiar with the Second World War, it's those pinpoint raids, those low level pinpoint raids, that define the Moscow more than than any other mission that it performed which is a good time to ask you what made the mosquito special because when we come to discuss aircraft and it's not something we do particularly on this channel in except in the context of the people flying them and how they yeah. they affect the you know the, the outcome of the war but it did excel at lots of different things you get certain aircraft that are very very good at one particular thing kind of the lysander flying agents in and out of france or it did a little bit more than that the c-47 transport and paratroops but mosquito did a bit of everything you know fighter fighter bomber you know almost a dive bomber role strategic yeah. bombing low level bombing um you know what what was it um that made it so special well i mean that that is the thing that made it so special is that i think it was actually unique uh, in the history of the whole history of aviation in being able to perform successfully uh, the sort of four pillars of, of air power and they are um, you know, air defense control of the skies uh, strike attack um, taking the fight to the enemy uh, intelligence gathering and reconnaissance um, and uh, and finally mobility and air transport and uh, because the mosquito I mean the, the perhaps the former three roles are you know well known um uh, the mosquito is a superlative reconnaissance aircraft it was a, a hugely successful night fighter particularly um and obviously the, the bombing and attack goes without saying um but it was also employed by boac the british overseas air, air uh, airways Co corporation um to fly people uh um, documents uh, and ball bearings um it, it, between scotland and, and sweden during the second world war so there was a there was a essentially a squadron of civilian registered mosquitoes uh, flown by civilian pilots um, uh, uh, that were performing a vital role throughout the Second World War, and uh, you know in that capacity, it, as I say, it completes those sort of four pillars. It was it was uniquely flexible. It was the sort of perfect size to uh, be nimble enough to cope with a fighter threat, but carry a sufficient warload. Mm -hmm. At sufficient range to be really useful as a bomber. I mean, it's it's easy to forget that um, this this two engine airplane with a crew of two, uh, which um, while it was not invulnerable to uh, German fighters, uh, certainly made their uh, the job of of interception very difficult. Um, was capable of delivering a bomb load uh, which was uh, similar to uh, to the to the B seventeen Flying Fortress, which had mm. a crew of ten. Um, four thousand pound bomb load uh, to Berlin and return. And it could do it twice in this in 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 a night. Wow! And I wonder whether that universal ability it had is one of the reasons why, perhaps at the time and just after the war, it didn't have maybe the the global fame of the Lancaster or the Spitfire yeah. or across the pond the, the P fifty one. Whereas today, nearly you know eighty years on, 
the connoisseur of World War II aircraft, I would think, would be the kind of one to mention it in their top five because yeah. now they have access to the multiple roles it was doing. But if you're a member of the public living in London or some, or Kent or something, the obvious um, Spitfire or Hurricane overhead was something more e easier to sort of grab onto, identify with all the all the formations of C-47s taking paratroopers to Arnhem, yeah. whereas the Mosquito... Half of what it did, the public never saw. Half of what it did, the rest of the RAF almost didn't saw, didn't see that, which which was which was intriguing. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it's an interesting point that those sort of single role air, aircraft um, kind of attracted a greater amount of uh, a, a, a sort of interest, plaudits, um, public attention, um, and I think what it's what i felt as if i discovered through working on the on the mosquito book was that um you know the spitfire had its advocates um and champions um the the lancaster uh, it, it it was was people's favorite airplane the p51 was favorite airplane uh, but what i think you'll find in sort of every case was that um people's second favorite airplane was always the mosquito whatever was number one their second favorite airplane was always the mosquito um and so um, you know, actually, you've got a, um, you know incredibly large people. It's a group of people who really love the mosquito, um, even if for this or that um, reason they might have preferred the Spitfire, preferred the Lancaster. But you know, if the Lancaster got into a dogfight, it was toast. If you wanted the Spitfire to fly a six hundred mile mission, it was going to let you down. But the mosquito could do both those things, um, and um, so I think yeah, the lack of of specialization, um, and that had not actually. Been the intention when they designed it uh, was that it was going to be you know all things to all men. Um, you know, initially it was going to be a bomber, and it was only the realization that um, when Bomber Command said they didn't want it and they wanted to concentrate on um, on a heavy bomber force uh, by Wilfred Freeman, who was um, then in charge of uh, uh, um, acquiring aircraft for the RAF. Only that he realized that the Mosquito um, with this incredible performance that was promised uh, was going to be able to fulfill a role as a reconnaissance aircraft uh, for the RAF that the, 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 the whole program was sort of kept alive because bomber command didn't really want it um, and so he found a sort of loophole um, uh, that allowed him to, uh, to to keep the mosquito program going I mean there were a number of attempts to to cancel it but somehow uh, he managed to sort of navigate his way through them well, isn't that the way that so many things that we think of as iconic today, like the SAS or certain yeah. gadgets and weapons, had to overcome numerous hurdles at the time? Uh, and now we would think, well, what, how on earth did they not yeah. that they, they they stumble? But that's how it was back in the war. We've got a first question coming in mm -hmm. about the Mosquito from Peter O'Connell saying, did the Mosquito's relatively small size and wooden construction reduce its radar signature in any meaningful way? Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. And yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, it did uh, reduce the um, the, the uh, radar signature. And you know, German uh, uh, German radars were not uh, fantastic. I mean, they were pretty blunt instruments. Um, but uh, it, it had a far less meaningful um, uh, impact on uh, than, than flying at low level. And and the Mosquito was able to fly, uh, you know, at low level in a way that you know uh, with obvious exceptions like the dam busters raid the heavy bombers mm. uh, could not um it was often also flying in smaller formations as well which again uh, in and of itself um would reduce uh the the uh, the, the range at which they were sort of picked up by radar um but there was a lot of metal um in a mosquito as well i mean the, the, there's those engines the uh, propeller blades there's the windows there's lots of stuff there which is um which is going to get picked up by radar and so i you know i, I can see that the the key word in the uh, the question is meaningful um and um I, my own view is no it didn't really reduce the uh, the radar uh, um cross section in a way that was meaningful uh, and uh, was something that could be taken great advantage of in the way that the mosquito was used in in uh in operations uh, there were there were other better ways of evading uh, uh detection until the the last possible minute brilliant stuff and brilliant response there and a good question that will actually dovetail us to move from the from the aircraft to the people, um, uh, Ian T is saying after the Boston or Blenheim, the Mozzie must have been like going from a Ford Fiesta to Ferrari. And um, 
I'll let you comment on that. But when we think of some of the other aircraft types, we can kind of think of pilots and crews who are identified with that. Lancaster is Guy Gibson and Battle of Britain, Spitfires, Hurricanes, where you take your pick of so many legends there. But the Mosquito, I mean, we'll come up some, with some of the people we talk, you'll be talking about later on with the Denmark raid. But I think Mosquito, for most people, doesn't necessarily have that immediate connection of personnel. So what sort of people ended up flying it? Where did they come from? Um, and, and what interesting characters did you find? Well, I mean, I, the, the book concentrates on one particular, um, I mean, actually one particular wing within two group within uh, Second Tactical Air Force. Um, and the, they were the ones uh, who were carrying out these, by and large, these pinpoint raids, 140 wing, um, which was made up of three squadrons, 21 squadron, um, an RAF squadron, 464, which was Australian squadron, uh, and 487, which was a uh, Royal New Zealand Air Force um, squadron, um, all of them on, obviously under uh, sort of RAF command. Uh, and they were very much the uh, uh, the kind of poster boys for what Basil Embry was trying to do. He inherited um, two group. Uh, he was in contention for running the Pathfinders um, and was chosen. Uh, Bomber Harris chose Don Bennett over uh, uh, Basil Embry for that, and perhaps because um, you know, he had he realized that Embry was better suited to really taking um uh, you know seeing the whites of the eyes of the enemy I mean he really uh, uh took took the war personally Basil Embry after having been shot down in France himself and uh, during the Battle of France flying at Blenheim um and I mean that's an extraordinary story uh all by itself. Uh, he was on the run for six weeks, killed his guards, uh, eventually um, escaped over the border into Spain um, and got back to the UK where he then sort of became equated with the Mosquito running a night fighter squadron um, at um, RAF Witten. Um, but um, when he took command of uh, two group, uh, he was absolutely, he, it was a sort of um, a real sort of uh, hodgepodge of airplanes he he uh, uh assumed command of the boss and mitchell were, were there uh there were no mosquitoes they had been taken by uh, basil Embry uh to form the base of the pathfinder group when two group went to uh, to two to, to, to second tactical air force um and uh, he was forced to uh, fight uh hard to get mosquitoes into two group because um the air ministry wanted to give him um an american plane called the Vulti vengeance which um he said uh after test flying it at, at boston down was going to be more of a danger um to his own air crews than it was to um uh to to the germans he regarded it as a sort of almost worse than a fairy battle which um i'm sure some of your viewers will remember uh had a torrid time of it early in the in the war um you know too slow, too vulnerable, etc. Um, you know, here are some of the men. Uh, I, actually, this is a quite interesting picture we've got here. Um, the uh, the pilot there is a chap called um, Ivo de Souza, um, who's one of the um, uh, pilots who uh, joined the Air, F Air Force from uh, from the Caribbean, um, and. Uh, he, uh, he was in nearly uh, in the early days of the the, um, the campaign against the V1s. Um, Ivo was nearly shot down by the guns that were protecting, that this is when um, squadrons were based at Gravesend, the guns that were protecting London from the V1 threat. Um, and uh, uh, after uh, he um, complained loudly um, and um, very swearily uh, over the RT, the, uh, some of the other uh, returning uh, mosquitoes uh, diverted to other airfields and within days uh, the whole uh, wing was um, uh, uh, moved to Thorny Island off the south coast um, but um, uh, Basil Embry uh, built a unit that was very much in his own image he was looking for men who took the fight to the enemy that he was looking for people like uh, we've got here Ted Sismore on the left and um, and uh, 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 his um, uh, complete. I was, I was going to say it was Bob Bateson, but um, uh, that is uh, Reggie Reynolds was the pilot that that flew with Ted um, before Bob Bateson, um, who flew the Copenhagen and the Ar Aarhus raid. But Reggie Reynolds um, and Ted Sismore um, bombed Berlin uh, at, in the middle of uh, Hermann Goering's speech um, and humiliated him uh, in front of an audience of millions around the world. And so, like Basil Embry. Um, uh, and following his escape from France, Ted Sismore also had a price on his head from the Third Reich. So they had that in common. And Ted Sismore very much sort of taken under Basil Embry's wing. He was only 23 um, at the end of the war. 
uh, but uh, his quality as a low-level navigator was sort of unrivaled, and he ended the war as the most de decorated navigator in the RAF, and he was part of uh, Basil Embry's um, planning cell at Two Group. Um, Reggie Reynolds, um, again, extremely brave aviator, but was... Um, uh, time expired before the, the two Copenhagen, two de to Danish raids. Um, and uh, there were others, you know, they, they, people were banging on the door of two group if they had that kind of uh, aggression and uh, desire to take the fight to the enemy that Basil Embry so cherished. So, you know, night fighter ace Bob Braham, who was uh, vying with Johnny Johnson to be the top RAF ace of the war, uh, beat a path to, uh, to to Basil Embry's door. Laddie Lucas uh, took a was willing to take a demotion in order to get onto the Mosquito Wing um, under under Basil Embry. So you got some really famous names there, some really capable flyers, um, and there were. I mean, we talked to, there was a question about moving from a, um, a Blenheim to a Mosquito yeah. being like going from a Fiesta to a Ferrari and just to sort of bring this um, uh, th th this sort of introduction to some of the air crews back to that. Um, it's a really interesting point in that there were crews, uh, uh, pilots who came uh, from uh, either perhaps from flying uh, with Bomber Command, flying heavies with Bomber Command uh, or flying Blenheims. Um, uh, or in the case of um, uh, uh, the, the uh, pilot who um, took was first took command of um, uh, of two group and was um, sadly sadly killed during the Amiens raid uh, from uh, from 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 SOE, um, they often came without sufficient experience of flying uh, at low level uh, to uh, to be sort of thrown. Uh, kind of right into the uh, right into the fray, um, and uh, certainly Basil Embry had hoped to lead uh, the Amiens raid um, himself, um, and was told he simply couldn't um, by uh, by by the, the uh, by his senior by senior officers Lee Mallory said, "You cannot lead this raid uh, yourself," and and he organised a, a, a meeting um, for. Um, for for Embry at the same time as the the uh, the mission itself, and it meant that uh, the new boss of uh, of, of the wing, um, Percy Picard, um, had to uh, had to fly the uh, the mission, had to lead the mission. There was no way he Embry was going to be able to give it to somebody more experienced without um, insulting um, Picard. But uh, he was sadly killed. Uh, in that mission, he was probably at the time the, the most famous RAF bomber pilot after um, after Guy Gibson because um, he'd mm. start um, target target for tonight. But um, that's just a good example of of how the mosquito could bite, or how that particular low level mission could bite uh, an, an inexperienced. Even though obviously Picard was hugely experienced as a as a uh, as a pilot and and uh, and brave beyond belief. Um, he was not experienced in that particular mission at the time he led the Amiens raid. And um, a good point about the, the personnel there, because, you know, reading the book, it's a cliche, but it did sound it deserving of a movie. The characters that come along, you just just when you think the most incredible characters come along, another one comes along and you say, oh, my God, <laughs> there's, there's a movie there. And there's already yeah. a discussion in the, in the sidebar about the, the kind of distinction between bomber and fighter and, yeah. and the mosquito is a definition of an aircraft that blurs yeah. those lines and kind of defi forges out its own kind of unique role and that 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 view there of the aircraft is is typical of that you know bombs and guns it's all it's about yeah. both isn't it well it is i mean and, and actually it's quite interesting talking about the distinction about sort of bombers and fighters i mean i talked a little bit there uh with you know percy picard basil Embry, ted sismore uh, and the rest of, of the mosquito pilots but um, they were escorted to, um, to to Copenhagen and back, and to Jutland and back by by Mustangs. And I found sort of equally interesting characters in the um, in the, the Mustang force as well. Um, and uh, I mean, there were people uh, like um, um, uh, no, I've completely completely forgotten his name now. Which, but it'll 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 come to me. Ah, here, here we've we've. Got them. Um, Mike Donne, who's on the uh, on the um, on the far left, there was in command of the um, the P fifty one wing that escorted them um, uh, kind of all the way to uh, uh, Copenhagen. He was Belgian. He'd um, managed to sort of 
cobbled together a tiger moth um, in a, that he'd found in a farmer's barn um, and uh, and fly it kind of all the way back to uh, to the UK uh, and join um, join join the air force. Um, you know who who else have we got um, uh, here? We've got Norwegian Anna Anna Austin. Uh, he was a boss of one of the um, one of the uh, other. Um, other squadrons, um, squadron dog there as well. I mean, that, that you've got this sort of extraordinary. I mean, one of the uh, one of the uh, Mustang pilots was the very first um, uh, pilot to fly into France after after D Day, and he also um, flew into Paris uh, before the for the liberation. And it's it's often the sort of um, peripheral uh, figures, particularly on the ground, who suddenly, um, as you sort of scratch a little bit, uh, were revealed to have these absolutely um, kind of extraordinary stories. Um, I mean, th these are two people who hardly feature in the book at all, but Peter Freuken was this sort of giant of, uh, of, a, of a Dane um, who was a polar explorer. He, he had won a film he'd made, uh, or a film that was based on his book, had won an Oscar about living uh, with the Inuit um, in Alaska. Um, he had lost a leg uh, after being trapped in um, uh, an avalanche, and he had said in his autobiography that he dug himself out of that um, uh, uh, avalanche using a dagger that he'd fashioned from his own frozen feces. Um, now, believe that or not, but that, mm. that was certainly what he was claiming. Um, and uh, his particular hobby after the invasion in, in Denmark, uh, and he was this giant of a man who used to wear a, a coat made of polar bear skin, which made him sort of twice the size that he already was. And he had a wooden leg. Um, he'd go right up into the faces of the, the Nazi occupiers um, and tell bellow at them, um, I'm a Jew. And what are you going to do about it? Um, and uh, they, you know, they arrested him, but he escaped. And then he went on a, uh, a publicity tour in the US trying to raise money to support the, the, the Danish resistance. Um, and I mean, the Danish resistance story was uh, that, that I hadn't been kind of aware of particularly before uh, getting started on, um, on, on the book. But at every turn, I found these extraordinary characters. And there was sort of one gathering just before the war in 1940 that gave me this uh, sort of glue um, that I was able to sort of use throughout the story to, uh, to, 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 to sort of bind the thing together. And we've got two of them here. Uh, well, I just want to interrupt and say yeah. that to me is one of the things I yeah. loved about the book is that some aviation books are just almost reprints of log books and squadron records. And it can be a bit samey, you know, took off, flew to the so-and-so target, came back, so and so many aircraft lost. So -and, -so. and after, after, you know, a few, a few dozen pages of that, you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm learning the, the historical record of this unit, but I'm not gripped by it. I'm not learning about the people. And, and, you know, we said at the beginning, it's two stories in one. It's the men who flew the mosquito, but it's the Danish element. And, and that to me is that was the genius is incorporating all that because when we get to Operation Carthage and, and, and the other you know, missions later on, it's that thorough grounding you 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 give by taking us to Denmark. So so uh, so yeah, you, you've already no, started it, talking about it. Yeah, it's really kind of you uh, to say so. I mean, that's definitely the, the sort of aspiration is to try to write something that uh, reads like a thriller. Um, I suppose if I was going to look for a, a, a touchstone um, in terms of this, the, the style I try to bring to, to the books I'm writing, it would be something like um, you know the classic about um, uh, liberation of Paris is Paris Burning, mm -hmm. um, where you've got a number of different strands to the story. Um, but none of them work unless you're invested in the fate of the characters involved. I mean, a story doesn't, I was once asked um, by, uh, by a, a, a best-selling thriller writer, um, what do I think is more important, plot or character? And I, having not really sort of thought about it, said, uh, well, they're both really important. And he said, um, the, the only thing ultimately that really matters is character. Uh, because unless you're invested in uh, what happens to, uh, to your, your, uh, your characters, it doesn't matter how the plot unfolds. Just you're not interested in what happens unless you're interested in uh, what happens to them. Um, and, uh, and, and it was really, really good advice. And so whenever I'm trying to uh, uh, um, research a book, I'm looking for stars, uh, sort of supporting characters and, and, and extras. And we've got two of the stars of the story here. And both of them uh, were it's sort of gathering in 1939, just before the war started in, in, at a stately sort of country estate in, um, in Denmark. 
two families, the Witchfelds um, uh, and uh, and the Lassens. Um, the Witch Monica Witchfeld uh, was a uh, um, sort of a, a, an Anglo-Irish aristocrat who married into the Danish aristocracy. Um, she became um, <clears throat> the the first uh, leader of the resistance, first woman in Denmark to be sentenced to death by the uh, by the Nazis. Um, uh, she was leading the resistance um, on her home island. <clears throat> her daughter. That, that's uh, so. That's Monica. Um, and uh, she's a remarkable uh, woman. Um, and uh, her daughter, uh, Inky, uh, was just sort of 18 at the time the war broke out, but ended up marrying uh, the leader of SOE in Copenhagen, <clears throat> subsequently escaped uh, with him uh, when the Gestapo were on their, uh, on their trail. Uh, and she also then earned her parachute wings and was going to be parachuted back into the Den Denmark just before the war's end. Uh, but Inky was remarkable. Um, and then they uh, were there just before the war with Monica's best friend, Suzanne Lassen, and her sons and their cousin. So one of her sons, um, uh, Anders, on the left there, uh, was, uh, I mean, he's kind of a feral character. He was a brilliant hunter, um, had a brilliant with a knife, brilliant with a bow and arrow, and he, he uh, became a sort of SAS legend. He was part of the SBS when it sort of fell under the, the wing of the SAS, part of Jellicoe's crew in the Aegean. And he was the only member of the wartime SAS to win the, uh, to win the VC. Um, his brother, France, also escaped uh, Denmark um, and uh, joined SOE's small raiding squadron like his brother just before it wrapped up. Um, and uh, he he was then parachuted back into Denmark, um, uh, where he was a, an explosives instructor and sorted out the whole radio telephone uh, network in Jutland after the Gestapo had destroyed it uh, prior to his arrival. Uh, his arrest precipitated the chain of events that led to the, the bombing of the, uh, the Gestapo headquarters in, uh, in Copenhagen. But their cousin, I mean, this is extraordinary that that their cousin, they were an they were a Danish German family. Their cousin um, Axel was there as well, um, and Axel predicted that by the next time they met, um, Denmark and Germany uh, would be at, at war. <clears throat> and you had a picture of Axel that you brought up just a second ago. So I think so. This is this is Axel. Um, he was tall, um, uh, carried himself well, sort of good looking, very um, uh, Aryan, uh, and he was. Um, he was a member of a sort of elite Prussian regiment um, and was uh, deployed to Ukraine where he was so disgusted uh, by what he witnessed of the SS's behavior um, to the Jews. It was a massacre um, that he decided he could no longer serve uh, the regime that um, uh, allowed or, or promoted that kind of uh, uh, behavior. And he, he realized he either had to desert uh, to be killed in action um, or actively try to bring down um, the Third Reich. And he chose the latter um, and got involved with Klaus von Stauffenberg. Um, and von Stauffenberg chose him to be the first person to try to assassinate Hitler. And the plan was that he was going to, as this sort of tall, good looking Aryan, uh, model uh, these new West, uh, sort of Eastern Front winter uniforms um, at uh, Hitler's um, wolf, wolf's lair in, um, in Eastern Prussia. Um, and uh, the plan was in place, the uniforms were all ready to go. Uh, von Stauffen, uh, sorry, uh, Axel um, uh, uh, von den Busch was there um, in re East Prussia, ready for this sort of um, uh, suicide bomb attempt. He was going. He was loaded up with uh, grenades. And he was just going to pull strings, hug Hitler, and blow them both to smithereens. Um, <laughs> when mosquitoes bombed Berlin, bombed the boxcar in the Berlin marshalling yard uh, that contained those prototype uniforms, they were destroyed. Uh, and the operation had to be called off. And by the time uh, there was any possibility of him being asked to do it again, he he'd lost a leg on the Eastern Front, and and only because of that escaped the purge of the German resistance that followed von Stauffenberg's attempt. So, in those five people, five, five remarkable people, all of whom met just months before the outbreak of the Second World War, you've got this sort of window into. 
uh, different theatres, um, different aspects of the war, all of which mean that um, that, that 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 mosquito story that is at the focus uh, mm. of it um, has uh, ha has a, a has a sort of window on the rest. It doesn't operate in isolation. It's there. Yeah, at, yeah exactly. And, and that, that is part of the bigger war. And that's why you know I love it, and the people who've read it have loved it so much because it could just be a and the Mark II had this, and the Mark III developed that, and 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 that would be interesting to a certain a, a demographic, but a wider demographic who would have thought? I'm sure there's people watching right now who didn't know we'd be getting into the assassination of Hitler and, <laughs> and, and SAS heroes and Victoria yeah. Cross recipients, and yet as you said, all in all part of integral part of this mosquito story, but. Time has come to, you know, you, we've, we've touched on, on Denmark a number of times there. So we, we ought to get to the kind of meeting. There were the, the, the two raids that you that you focus on. And, of course, the book is a big, fat, thick one, folks. So we're only covering a tiny aspect of it tonight. So whatever we cover today, there's way more and way more incredible characters in the actual book. But 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 we're, we're getting towards the end of the war now. It's at the end of 44, early 45. So explain where Copenhagen comes into the story. Well, Denmark had... Um... A sort of unique experience um, during the war. Um, it, uh, it it had hoped to maintain its neutrality, um, and Germany uh, had uh, no real interest in in Denmark whatsoever. But it needed the air bases in the north of Jutland, and um, Jutland is that uh, peninsula you can see going north with um, Aarhus in it. Um, it needed the air bases. Uh, near to um to to or who's there um as a stepping stone to norway so it was almost um, sort of invaded um in april 1940 uh, as a sort of well it was invaded as a sort of byproduct of hitler's desire to get to uh, to get to norway um and um uh, the Danish government, realising that uh, it simply didn't have the military uh, capability to resist that invasion, capitulated quickly <clears throat> uh, and uh, agreed that uh, to the, the, the um, Third Reich's demand that um, it remained new, its neutrality would be guaranteed by by the Nazis, um, the government and the king would remain in power. It was all over so quickly that unlike Norway, the king and the government weren't able to escape. <clears throat> Or indeed, like um, the Netherlands, Belgium, France uh, weren't able to escape. So legally, uh, Denmark kind of became part of the axis. It had a uh, had a democratically elected government. The king was still in place, um, and uh, the, uh, the 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 British the, the members of the British legation uh, there in Copenhagen was sort of spirited out in an act of um, <clears throat> well, actually misplaced magnanimity by uh, by the Germans on a sealed train. Um, but even on that sealed train, the Danish resistance, um, when it pulled into a station through a roll of uh, plans uh, through the window, which shared all the sort of uh, what they knew then um, of the German military dispositions in Denmark. So within days of uh, that invasion, um, the uh, Danish army intelligence um, <clears throat> were uh, organizing themselves uh, and sh trying to find ways of sharing what they could uh, with the allies and yet as i say legally denmark couldn't be an ally because of the situation uh, of its government mm -hmm. so denmark couldn't um, supply it uh, couldn't have its own regiments couldn't have its own squadrons like the poles or the belgians or the uh, or the french um really uh those those fighting danes uh who were able to contribute to the war effort were made up of um uh, of trawlermen uh, and merchant seamen who had been at sea at the time of the invasion uh, and were invited to make their way to the uk um, rather than make their way home <clears throat> and anders lassen happened to be one of them uh, he wanted to be a fighter pilot and actually probably would have made a very good one but he was he's, he had absolutely no maths he was no academic um and so eventually he, he sort of made his way to uh, to the to the commandos but so denmark's war was sort of characterized by this this odd unique um position this sort of neutrality guaranteed by <clears throat> by the germans and it wasn't really until 1943 that um efforts by the british um, and by uh, the, the Danish resistance themselves to uh, to sort of foment a, 
a split between the Danish government and the German occupiers really were effective. And it's really from, from that point on, um, from 1943 onwards, um, there were a couple of catalysts early in there. There was a, a, a mosquito raid on a factory in Copenhagen uh, that uh, was producing U-boat parts that uh, sort of inspired many of the, the that inspired the Danish resistance and uh, inspired the civilian population to realise that they, they, they hadn't been abandoned. And suddenly that RAF roundel became a sort of symbol of resistance. They were painting it onto, onto tie pins. They were knitting um, sort of bobble hats with the, the RAF logo on and, <clears throat> and sort of painting V for victory. Um, on sort of graffitied around town, but also 1943 was the uh, the January 1943 was when the uh, the SOE finally got a leader into Copenhagen who was organised, aggressive, uh, front footed, uh, and uh, and was able to start sort of maximising the impact of SOE's support in terms of weapons, radios, and all the rest of it uh, uh, with um, the various arms of the uh, the Danish resistance from from the military to the civilian to uh um to to, to the communists actually being the third major uh, sort of components of that and and that it was made up of those three different elements all of whom had big characters involved uh in them um, underneath um uh the, that that soe leader it's those three elements that in the end were so crucial to the decision to uh, to bomb that Gestapo headquarters um, in Copenhagen. It, that that division within the resistance is is ultimately what's key to why Denmark became in the very late later stages of the war so important. Well, well, a thorough answer to that one there. So, which brings us to the raid itself. We'll we'll kind of skip over to the the the, yeah. the Copenhagen raid, I think, because it's the one that's most most famous yeah. and the one that that is the central part of your book. So, um, you know, you've got some amazing photos, and it, you know, as as the reader will find out, it encompasses everything that the mosquito was good about, but also, and we'll get to it later on, everything that can be a tragic result. Uh, and we'll, yeah. we'll get we'll get to that in a minute. But but take take us through as much of the raid you want to do as you as you can. But obviously there's there's yeah. more in the books. Don't don't give all the spoilers <laughs> away. Well, I mean, you know, anyone can look up what what happened. Um, and there's, you know, there's even been a movie on Netflix which has a you know particularly, I think, um, uh, singular view of it all um, as well. But um, you know, it, it, in a nutshell, um, the the uh, the RAF's raid on uh, the Gestapo headquarters in Jutland, in Aarhus, which happened in October uh, 1944, saved the resistance there um, and uh, and kept them in business. Um, the re resistance was sort of split into regions. Um, in Copenhagen, however, and as I said, a chain of events leading from the arrest of, um, of uh, Franz Lassen, Axel's brother, um, uh, was in danger by early 1945 of being rolled up by uh, by the the Gestapo. Uh, the Gestapo, after the destruction of their headquarters um, in uh, in Jutland, uh, had realised that they needed to to do what they could to try to prevent the Copenhagen um, headquarters from from suffering an, uh, an RAF attack as well. So they camouflaged it um, and they built um, cells in the attic uh, and put. Uh, leading members of the resistance that they had um, in captivity uh, in those cells as a human shield, feeling that there was no way that the RAF would attempt to, to, to bomb the shell house, um, that uh, modern, huge modern office building in central Copenhagen, um, uh, at risk of killing um, all of those members of the resistance, senior members of the resistance. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> And yet by January 1945, the, the situation within the Danish resistance in the capital was so desperate um, that uh, they had to make a decision about whether or not um, to call in the RAF. The job was so difficult and so likely, uh, given the precision needed um, to cause uh, uh, civilian casualties, that Basil Embry, uh, who, who I don't think really wanted to carry it out, um, said that he would only... Um, only only staged the raid if he had a uh, word from somebody on the ground in Copenhagen that it was absolutely necessary. He said that as many as 300 civilians might might lose their lives, despite um, that uh, 140 wings uh, ability of, of, mm. of putting bombs on targets. You know, you can never account for everything that might uh, happen during a complex raid like that. 
and Ollie Lippmann, uh, the new leader of uh, SOE, uh, who'd only been in the country since January, uh, said, yes, you, you've got to come, you've got to help us, we're going to be rolled up. And the danger of that, uh, if, if, um, the, if the, the resistance went, um, was that um, you created a, a great instability in Copenhagen in, and, and in, in Denmark more widely. An instability in a country that otherwise was not a problem for the Allies was the very last thing they needed. They were moving uh, east across northern Europe uh, towards Germany. Um, if they suddenly had to uh, uh, divert to Copenhagen, to, to, to divert to Denmark, that put at risk their ability to uh, to, to get to Berlin to, to defeat, um, defeat the Nazis. And we'd seen the way that could happen in both Poland uh, and in France. You remember... Uh, many of your viewers will remember that an uprising in Warsaw um, mm. caused sort of horrific uh, loss of life and bloodshed. Um, others, perhaps those who read um, is Paris Burning, will remember that um, the communists, uh, in, an, in an effort to uh, uh, kind of get the jump on um, the Gauls' uh, resistance um, in Paris, uh, uh, staged an uprising um, uh, uh, ahead of the liberation and provoked um, a fierce German response. Um, uh, and that caused Eisenhower to have to divert to Paris when his plan had been to bypass Paris all the time. So uh, you had 300,000 German troops in, in Denmark. Um, if the situation deteriorated to the point where uh, the country was no longer stable, um, that could completely uh, upset the Allies' plans. And so Denmark became far more important than it had ever been prior to that. And so preserving uh, the status quo and the resistance's um, uh, position within that was actually a critical, uh, was a sort of mission critical effort for the Allies. And so given the nod from Copenhagen, Embry said, we'll, we'll do it. And this was, a, it was an extraordinary thing to, to do. And it was led by Ted Sismore. You first of all had to uh, cross um, uh, the North Sea. And uh, they, they crossed the North Sea. This is 18 mosquitoes or 20 mosquitoes, if you include the two uh, reconnaissance aircraft and another um, uh, another 30 uh, Mustangs um, escorting them. So it's a huge force at low level coming all the way from RF first field there, 300 miles across the North Sea. Um, and there's no way of fixing your position. You've just got to do that by dead reckoning. Um, uh, calculating is on the wind, wind speed, your ground speed, the time, compass, um, stopwatch. And this is this is a picture taken during the actual raid. So you get a sense of how low they were flying uh, and how little opportunity there is to fix your position. Um, Ted Sismore actually used he re, he likened it to more to to driving than to flying because you were you, you were looking out of the front um, and that was how you kind of got your your bearings you couldn't look down and get a bird's eye view and he used to fly with um, uh, Admiralty um, uh, uh, sort of charts called the the North Sea Pilot that would give details of features along the coast and Denmark's coast is pretty flat. I mean, some of the things he was looking out for were particularly high sand dunes or or buoys um, or church steeples in order to know that he'd uh, he was uh, reaching landfall at the right point. But he did. They reached landfall in exactly where they needed to. Uh, and that then they flew low level um, across Denmark. And this, speaking to uh, one of your uh, uh, viewers earlier questions, it was only once they, they made landfall that they were picked up by radar uh, and the uh, the network of um, ground observers that the, the, the Germans had all around Denmark. And they tracked the progress of this force all the way uh, across the country, um, not sure what, what the target would be. Um, and um, they split in th into three um because they had to separate the um the attack into boxes of six airplanes so that the bombs at the of the first uh, section didn't explode just as the uh aircraft of the second section were flying through and destroy them so they split into three um you had three sections coming through each with a minute separating each of them uh the first ones came in low over copenhagen led by ted sismore and, and, and bob bateson and th this is a picture taken, um, it's actually, I think, of uh, one of the, yeah, it's a 464 squadron um, airplane um, from, so from the, from the second uh, section of mosquitoes um, and is uh, flying around the city trying to make absolutely certain that they're going to hit the right target. Um, and uh, 
uh, an airplane in that uh, second section. I talked about how um, Percy Picard had been inexperienced at um, Amiens. The new squadron boss of 21 Squadron um, uh, was uh, was quite inexperienced um, uh, when uh, when he at, at flying low level in the Mosquito um, when he flew on this mission. He'd been a, a heavy bomber pilot prior to that. Um, uh, he um, uh, he hit his name's Peter Klebo. Um, he hit as they came in low over a uh, railway marshalling yard, a huge sort of lighting standard. Um, he lost an engine. It's here. You can actually see the dents in the top of of, of that uh, if you look closely. He clipped that, um, managed to somehow kind of stay in the air. Uh, he flew down the middle of a, a, a street, um, lost both his bombs, and, and I think as a result of that managed to gain a little altitude uh, that took him a, a little further um, over Denmark. And I think he saw a, a, a wide boulevard and was attempting uh, either to land on that or to get to the park just beyond that. But sadly, he didn't make it and he crashed into some garages um, that were on, as I say, this, this wide boulevard. Garages were full of fuel, full of tires, the rest of it. And obviously he, he had an airplane full of fuel um, too. And a huge amount of thick black smoke went up. And what this did was confuse the second and the third sections of mosquitoes. Um, and that garage was right next to um, a school. Um, and um, a handful of the uh, aircraft in the third section, particularly one aircraft in the second section, I think, and a handful of the aircraft in the, uh, the, third, the third section, the Kiwi section, um, be believed that that smoke, which at the time was was uh, uh, thicker and blacker than that coming off the shell house, um, was the target and they bombed it. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of children um, and their teachers, it was a, um, it was a convent school, uh, lost their lives. Um, and uh, you know, remarkably, when I was researching this, um, I uh, met one of the survivors um, of that. Uh, and he, he took me um, to the site of, the, um, of, of where he had been to school, where he'd been dug out of the rubble. And he sort of looked up and down the street. Um, and we talked about um, Peter Klebo and his navigator, Reg Hall, um, and about all the other pilots, a number of others. There were nine aircrew lost their lives on this raid, shot down by flak, mainly from a German cruiser um, that was in the harbour here. In fact, this, uh, here I am with John Holstein, uh, the boy I was talking talking about, now 80 years old, um, in uh, Copenhagen, Hagen's new new harbour. Behind us is an old Danish warship, um, but in uh, in March 1945, uh, there was a German cruiser there, uh, sending up enormous amounts of flak over Copenhagen. But John was dug out of the rubble. Um, he survived uh, a, a, amazingly after conquering a fear of flying. Went on to become a pilot himself uh, and run a an aviation engineering company, but we, we visited all the sites together. Um, and he sort of looked up and down the street where his school had been. And I asked him about the air crew and he, he just said quietly uh, to himself or to, to, to himself, to me, that he regarded them as heroes. They were heroes. Um, and, uh, and the Gestapo headquarters, you know, from a military point of view, um, despite this tragic uh, um, uh, uh, destruction of the school, and this is a memorial that stands there today. From a military perspective, the uh, the mission was a success. And this is what I meant by the complexity of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a sort of simple story. Um, you know, there are always, um, you know, tragic innocents um, who lose their lives in war. Um, but the Gestapo headquarters was destroyed. All of the records contained uh, inside it that had all the addresses, all the connections, all of those resistance networks were destroyed. Um, the, the, the Danish resistance survived uh, effectively all the way through to the end of the war as a result of this mission. This is the, um, the, the shell house after it. And what's really remarkable, I mentioned this human shield um, in, uh, at, at the beginning. Um, so accurate were the bombs from the uh, for that from that first uh, box, um, particularly um, the the uh, earliest aircraft. They they put them in through the ground floor. I mean, I think that there's certainly some luck as well as judgment involved here. Um, you know, uh, but they put the bombs in through the, the the ground floor rather than through the roof. 
Um, I mean, I think they were simply giving themselves the biggest possible target. Um, but uh, 18 of the, um, the 25, 26 prisoners that were in the, uh, in the attic managed to escape before you see the, um, the, the burnt out ruins of, uh, of, of the shell house here. So the building was sort of collapsing around them. I mean, it's, it's sort of you know, it's like, like the sort of scenes you see in a movie. The building was collapsing around them uh, and they managed to get out and make their way to uh, safety. Four of them actually jumped from the uh, from the fourth floor, and a couple of them uh, survived that uh, uh, as well. Um, and these are the ruins of the um, of the French school, the convent school mm. um, that John was. You see the the, the bricks, uh, the sort of the stonework just at the bottom, um, with the truck in front of it. Um, that was that was John's classroom, um, and he. Um, he was trying to escape from that uh, when uh, the building collapsed and he was trapped underneath the door of, um, of, of, the, of, of one of the, of the loos. It was a, a, a toilet door, um, which mm. kind of kept it alive. Um, but I mean, it's a miracle that anybody, there were uh, nearly 400 people in that school, uh, 87 pupils were killed, but that obviously means, you know, 300 plus survived, yeah. which when you look at that is uh, pretty extraordinary. And that complexity <laughs> is on the faces of the, uh, and that's Basil Embry on the left, I think, of the, yeah, that, that's yes, in the visit to Denmark after the war. And, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, we have this, uh, we're burdened as British with this idea of the few, the Battle of Britain, mm -hmm. the defenders of, of, the, of the home country and the, the mm -hmm. spitfires flying over the White Cliffs, all, all that aspect. And yet when you get to the end of the war like this, you, you're talking about this type of, mission that incredibly brave flyers are involved in that that bring about this complex reaction because mm. you know my brain is both admiring the incredible ability of these crews to, to you know using nautical maps to get across the north sea and navigate their way there and and do this precision bombing that they had done before and yet the tragedy of a school being hit and yeah. yet the survivor you meet you met referring yeah. to those heroes it is complex what what yeah. you know i did a little show this well, I mean, yeah. about seeing red army memorials in 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 budapest yeah. and Bratislava and how complicated it is seeing you know, history doesn't need to be neat tied up in boxes no 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 i mean and i think this this photograph here uh speaks speaks volumes i mean you yeah. you, yeah, but you mentioned north sea maps i mean it, it, it's worth bearing in mind when we talk about precision bombing they didn't have gps they didn't have laser guided uh, bombs, you know, th th this, I mean, they didn't even use bomb sites for this. I mean, they were absolutely using uh, hand-eye coordination um, and skill. But this photograph really speaks volumes. On the left, you've got Basil Embry, then Bob Bateson in glasses, then you've got Bob Iredale, who was boss of the um, Australian squadron, um, and then Ted Sismore on the right. They were invited back to Copenhagen after the war uh, by the people of Denmark. Um, they were given Danish knighthoods uh, for, mm. uh, for the job that they did. Um, I mean, the, the levels of uh, forgiveness, of understanding uh, 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 from within Denmark uh, uh, are extraordinary. But but also, I think that the you know the courage of these men to go back there and meet yeah. uh the families of of of, uh, of of those who lost their lives uh i mean it does it I, it it moves me uh enormously even to sort of think about it now and i you know uh you know it, it has on occasion moved me to tears as well that the uh the the story of the sort of reconciliation that there was after the war between these um these heroic air crews and um and the people of denmark and 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 Johnny Johnson, uh, I mentioned earlier, the, the, who ended up uh, um, uh, as the RF's leading ace of the war, ended up going to um, to, 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 to Denmark after the war to, to lead the RAF um, contingent that was based there uh, after the liberation. When he realised what had happened in Copenhagen, he laid on an air show um, by the RAF to um, to raise money for uh, the families of the victims of, um, uh, of the Shell House raid. Um, and uh, I mean, it, it was it was a it was a massive success, uh, uh, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people attended it. And you, it, they had they had. Uh, spitfires and typhoons and meteors typhoons attacked a, a flying a, an old german flying boat um uh, that was uh, off the coast and the culmination of, of this air show was um a low fast fly past by uh, 18 
mosquitoes from Basil Embry's 140 wing. Um, and th th the fortunes of those, uh, those air crews and the Danes, like John Holstein, um, and the members of the resistance were kind of intertwined from then on, and they would have reunions. There were remor memorials erected both to the to the, 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 the those at the school, um, but also at the shell house that where the new new office block was put up to the air crew, uh, both of the the Mustang crews and the um, mos mos uh, mosquito crews who lost their lives um, on on that mission. And you know, I think that that. Um, you know, nothing really speaks more powerfully about the the, uh, the sacrifice on on all sides um, that was required, military and civilian, um, European, British, um, uh, uh, um, to 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 defeat the uh, a, a terrible evil. I mean, uh, you know, these something like that does not come uh, come cheaply, um, and um, you know, I. I I, I just hope I've been able to do justice to, the, to all those sort of different elements of the story um, in, in the book, because, uh, you know, it, it sort of felt at times like a heavy responsibility um, to, uh, to to tell the story that, uh, you know, that, that um, you know, all these remarkable, remarkable people had sort of gifted me. Well, that you have done that. And I think Phil Boldworth, who's a regular viewer, said is that who would have thought an episode that seemed to lead down the techie direction would end up being about people? And that is essentially exactly what your book does. You know, it's it's got a picture of a mosquito on the cover. It's called Mosquito, but it's actually about people uh, 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 that the mosquito brought together in, in ways of heroism and, as you say, tragedy. And yet out of that... Um, you know, comradeship and, and shared experience and the fact you were able to go to Denmark and even the air crews went to Denmark is, is so important. And so I think that that therefore is an, an ideal time to to bring this to an end. But I'm going to one final question for you is, are you going to step back to the post-war era for the next work? Or are you going to, are you going to venture into World War II again? Because the World War II <laughs> audience would, would, would not want to see you go after such an epic start. Um, I, I think I've, I've become this year a member of the Afflicted. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, once you are, that's it. You uh, know, you, you, you uh, yeah. can't go back. Now. I, 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 I'm not quite ready to uh, to to um, say for certain what I'm working on next, but I have been been to the archives. Um, I um, I've been reading around a new subject, and I think it's it's kind of 99% certain that I'm going to be sticking with the um, Second World War. So um, I know what watch this space. I'm on I'm on Twitter if people want to. Yeah. Uh, Keep an eye on that. Well, as I said before, folks, the links to purchasing the book are in the description below, as they are to Roland's website, where you'll find his social media links. I've got my copy here. It's it's it, it is a thorough um, history of the aircraft, but as we've said a million times during the show, intertwined with some incredible people, all of whom are legends, and the the bringing together the story on the ground and in the air, and the people you, you did a masterful job, and it's been my privilege talking to you. So. Uh, We'll let you get away. And, folks, I'm back in with Andy H. And tomorrow, talk about the 52nd Lowland Division attacking Germany. And we've got one more show on Friday with Ben Main talking about Operation Charmwood in Normandy. So we better have a brief a brief sojourn to the skies, go back to the ground again tomorrow. Thank you, Roland, for joining me. Thank you, everybody, for your fantastic questions. And I hope you go out and buy the book because it really is an absolute blinder. Thanks so much. It's uh, been a real pleasure. Cheers, Paul. Thanks. Bye, everybody.